KC Squared here. Today I'm going to be talking to my pal Steve Cunningham. Steve is one of my favorite guitar players here on the Atlanta scene, and he was kind enough to drop by today and share a bit of his musical journey with us. Not only that, uh, he also reeled off some killer licks on lap steel and electric guitar while he was here, so let's check it out. Welcome, Steve, and hey, thanks uh, for doing this, and uh, it's going to be good to talk to you. So, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about how uh, you got started, uh, got started in music, and where you're from, and uh, and just uh, get us going on the story of Steve. All right, cool. Well, I'm from Rochester, New York, and I started playing guitar when I was 14 because uh, my, my friend Dennis Durrell brought a guitar to school, and they had a, a little birthday party for one of the girls in the music room. And that whole day, all the girls were like, oh, Dennis, he's such a good, you know, ooh, you know, talking about his guitar playing. I was like, you know, you know, screw that. You know, I've got a guitar at home. So I went home and I got my, uh, it was my, my dad's old guitar. And, and I went and pulled it out. And, and really, it was sort of inev inevitable that I was mm -hmm. going to be playing guitar because I really had really gotten seriously into listening to music maybe a year prior. So I felt like I was on a collision course with the instrument. But that was, you know, sort of the, the, uh, the catalyst, I suppose. Right. So I went home, and from that day on, I just started practicing, like really, like two, three hours a day, and uh, just self-taught, just anything. A lot I had a lot of sheet music, so mm -hmm. I was just trying to learn chords and stuff, and didn't know anything about lead guitar, you know, about mm -hmm. single notes. I used to, uh, you know, put on like live, you know, the, the Skinner live at the at the Fox was mm -hmm. it one more from the road, I think right, it was called, right. and I listened to live Freebird, and I used to play air guitar. You know, going like this because I didn't know what made that sound. So I just, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, got into playing pretty seriously, and uh, found myself drawn towards uh, you know, of course, a, a lot of southern rock, and uh, the, the, there was this Magic ninety two was the one of the mm -hmm. rock stations in Rochester, and that previous Christmas I got a, a clock radio, and also one of those old handheld you know the tape recorders like mm -hmm. the ones at school back in the day, right, right. and. I tilted the, the clock radio so that the speaker was pointing at the little condenser mic, and I used to make these little mixtapes. And uh, Magic 92 used to have Magic 92 minutes of different artists, mm -hmm. and they did Southern Rock, and I recorded all that on cassette, and they also uh, they did Zeppelin. Wow. So I had these tapes of Zeppelin and Skinner, or Skinner, uh, Southern Rock, mm -hmm. Skinner, Allman Brothers, Wet Willie, Marshall mm -hmm. Tucker, and I was really into all that stuff, all Molly right. Hatchet. So, uh, I just, uh, you know, sort of between me trying to pick out what I could of that stuff, which was nil, and then also going through like kind of Fleetwood Mac and John Denver sheet music, you know, kind of teaching myself <laughs> right. chords, I, uh, you know, just kind of took a stab at it. And I guess just through sheer hours and perseverance, I was able to get someplace with it. Um, I had a really good music teacher in, in, in school who used to kind of throw me out of class and he'd say, you go in the back room and practice mm. because he knew I was really into it. And his right. son was a professional musician, a guitar player. So um, kind of kind of, you know, went that route for a while. Eventually took a, took a few lessons and, and learned some cool stuff, learned some scales mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, practiced that stuff a lot. Um, and uh, you know, got eventually got into like you know some got into Yes and Genesis mm -hmm. stuff right. like that. Eventually found uh, through a, a good friend of mine got into Fusion, mm. which um, you know uh, actually a friend of my mom's had tickets to see Pat Metheny. Uh. Asked if I wanted to come along, and I you know I had no exposure to that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. I remember I was supposed to go to a, a, a church uh, sleepover that night with a, a youth group I was in, and um, I was like, yeah, I went to the concert. And the concert blew me away to the point. I mean, I didn't know that stuff was possible. <laughs> right. It was just amazing. And I um, remember I went to the sleepover afterwards, and I just kind of sat in a room by myself, sort of like catatonic, because <laughs> I was still processing mm -hmm. all that music. And that was like kind of a defining moment, seeing Metheny and just seeing that level of musicianship, right. you know, instrumental music. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Especially at that age. Yeah. And yeah, so. I think I was like 15, maybe. And, um, you know, eventually I got into... Uh, you know, Holdsworth by way of Bruford, mm -hmm. you know, and um, Return to Forever, but always mixed with a dose of, you know, you know, Rush, mm -hmm. Yes, a uh, lot of Genesis, but still, you know, Southern Rock kind mm -hmm. of stuff too, right. and just a lot of stuff going around. Uh, you know, eventually got into like, you know, bluegrass and kind of country guitar, that mm -hmm. old timey kind of stuff, David Bromberg. Right. Um, uh, and, and it was great because all this stuff, you know, I was into, you know, uh, uh, 
all this stuff surely you know for, for the love of music mm -hmm. not realizing that you know this was going to actually have a, a payoff at some point right so i wasn't thinking about i think at that point i, I knew i was going to be a rock star it was inevitable <laughs> you, you just know? knew it <laughs> I, I just knew it you know i knew i was going to be you know I, you know 30 years old I, i'm you know which yacht am i going to be on you know i yeah, really yeah, that, took that for granted you know i remember thinking that too yeah. knowing it yes knowing it <laughs> yeah and knowing it to the point question. where i don't really have to do anything because it's going to happen yeah so it's <laughs> I never, I never really did anything needs plan proactively. D. Yeah, right. My family was all like, well, Steve, you know, this music thing is great, but you should really go to college and get a backup plan. I was like, nah, you know, if you knew what I knew, you'd know how ridiculous those <laughs> statements good. are. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of wisdom there on my behalf. But, um, you know, of course, uh, Eat em and Smile came out. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that changed a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, Steve Vai and... Uh, you know, I kind of got into that stuff, but I was still into my bluegrassy kind of stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, Joe Pass. Right. You know, I was really, really got into a lot of different types of music, which really helped me out a lot with what I do now and just like making a living as a guitar mm -hmm. player. Um, well, it's interesting that you were that open minded at that age, you know, because a lot of a lot of mu young musicians aren't that open to a lot of different styles early yeah that's that's a blessing really I, I get it really it really was and maybe you know i don't know there were a bunch of you know my, my friends and myself that were into all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so i guess a lot of it was just sort of that's just sort of what we did you know yeah. but um funny story you know, about Metheny mm -hmm. was uh you know i used to see him live he used to come through rochester all the time and i saw him live probably four or five times within like a three-year span mm -hmm. and this one time um this buddy of mine where we were hanging out jamming and so my buddy was like hey you know uh, uh i had this crappy acoustic guitar and he's like man you, you know dude you should you should go and try to sit in with Metheny." i'm like oh dude really he goes oh yeah man you should you know bring bring your guitar and I bet you, you know, you could go sit in with him. I'm like, oh, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking maybe we could do like blues and A or something oh, like right. that. You know, what a freaking <laughs> idiot, you know? So I've got this crappy acoustic guitar, no case. And we go over to this college where he was playing. Got there early. And we're walking around through the, the catacombs trying to find him. Uh -huh. And we come into this big room where there's all this food, you know, set up. All these deli platters and stuff and we're like oh dude food this is awesome so we go start making ourselves plates and stuff of course it's methane it's, it's for his band and stuff you know they were probably sound checking or something and this woman comes out and she goes she's like uh may i help you i got a mouthful of like you know turkey and and stuff like that and you know i'm carrying this guitar in one hand have this plate of sandwiches and stuff i'm like yeah it's pat around and she goes uh you really need to leave. You're not supposed to be here. That's actually for Mr. Metheny. I'm like, oh, well, tell Pat, like, I'm looking for him, you know, because I wanted to sit in. You know, finally, she's just about to call security. We leave. And thank God it didn't work out for me to sit in with him because I'm, I'm, I remember sitting at the concert. And again, I'd seen him before when I was much younger. Um, and this is like, you know, four years later. And, and, uh, and I'm sitting there perspiring thinking of me being up there playing with them, uh -huh, asking to play right, blues and A. Right. But anyways. <laughs> Your um, guardian angel showed up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank God that woman like totally, she chased us out, like basically with a broomstick. That's but, uh, funny. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, down in Rochester for a while, playing in bands, uh, you know, teaching a bunch. Mm -hmm. And I forget how I, uh, I'd heard some good things about Atlanta, mm -hmm. about the music scene. And I also knew the weather was warm and I was really into playing tennis at the time. Um, I was no good, but um, I figured, oh, coming down here, I can play tennis year-round. Right. Um, I remember running into a uh, great guitar player in town, Eddie Wright, mm. and uh, we I forget how we hooked up. I think he was teaching at a store that I was going to when I first moved to town, and we kind of got together, and we would jam and stuff, and, right. you know, a guy's a, is a monster, and we talked about playing tennis, right. and we went out and played, and he just totally cleaned my clock at tennis, <laughs> you know, as well as guitar, so, you know, oh. there's a moral to that story somewhere, but... Um, uh, you know, came down to Atlanta and all that stuff I had done, you know, all those different styles really served me well as far as really having to, to make a living to support a family, right. you know, as a guitar player. Yeah, so I, I eventually got into doing sessions and had a friend of mine I was in a band with uh, who, was, who, who was kind of a, a local, I don't know, I guess, jingle kind of mm -hmm. producer. And he was always trying to get me to, you know, man, you got to come over and you'd be a, a really good in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I always hated playing in the studio. Right. I hated it. <laughs> I just, I hated it. I hated the pressure. I hated uh -huh. everything about it. And he kept after me 
and even had me come over to his studio and, and put a reel together for mm-hmm. me and um, you know plugged me with some good contacts and you know after a short amount of time I was getting all this this work I mean mm-hmm. I was doing wow. you know at least a couple hundred sessions a year um, wide variety a variety of music mm-hmm. um, and that's where listening to all that music when I was a kid really served me well because mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'd go, you know, one day would be doing a dobro thing. The next day would be doing like some, you know, faux metal kind of guitar. <laughs> right. and, and it was great. I really yeah. enjoyed that. A lot of hip hop stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my, my guitar collection really accumulated mm-hmm. because I could really justify going out and buying all these guitars because, right. right. well, I'm, I'm going to use them. You Absolutely. Know? And uh, I did that for a while and um, really learned to really enjoy the, the, the pressure. Mm-hmm. It kind of went did a, a 180. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and and the stuff was was paying really good too, so yeah, that helped nice. too. It's yeah. like that sort of became, you know, almost what it was about. Uh-huh. It was about yeah, making all. I couldn't believe I was making that kind of money for just mm-hmm. going and playing guitar. You mm-hmm. know, um, did that for a while. That that stuff kind of went away. Mm-hmm. I think I maybe I didn't get burned out, but um, I wasn't as good as uh, you know. I, I had to be kind of. You know, had to had to make phone calls mm-hmm. and and kind of sell myself, which mm-hmm. I was never good at. And I think I got kind of. You know, I, I just stopped doing that after a while. And plus, you know, the libraries came along mm-hmm. where ad agencies weren't hiring composers mm-hmm. that would hire guys like us. Mm-hmm. They would just go and, and find music off these libraries, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I think I sort of saw that coming. Even at, at the height of my, you know, session career, I kind of knew that, you know, this is not going to last. So enjoy mm-hmm. it while you can. Right. Um, you know, making the kind of money we were making and and being able to you know play some cool stuff it's like it seemed too good to be true and of course right. you know it was tell us a little bit about um what kind of gigs you've been doing since you're not doing as many sessions now well um you know even back in the day i was always gigging a bunch um and luckily it's been a pretty wide range of stuff you know it's like i've always had you know doing doing the corporate kind of wedding mm-hmm. money gigs mm-hmm. you know and i've and i've uh you know, been fortunate enough to play with some really good players in really good situations mm-hmm. where there was actually a little bit of almost musical integrity involved. Right. So it was kind of it's kind of cool. Makes um, a difference. And uh, really, just playing a really wide range of stuff, man. Um, you know, do, you know some some bar stuff. Uh, you know, some you know little tours. Mm-hmm. You know, different parts of the country and the world. Uh, playing some you know playing some good music with some really good players. Right. Um, uh, being a being a family guy, you know, with kids and stuff, and you know, uh, you know, stay at home mom, mm-hmm. you know, I really had to focus on, you know, really yeah. chasing paper. You know what right, I'm saying? So, right. so there there were definitely some some opportunities. Uh, hey, you know, some really good opportunities I had to pass on. Um, mm-hmm. Really kind of prominent stuff where mm-hmm. it just was a little bit too unknown as far yeah. as the the long term financially. Right. So. Um, but you know, it's, it's cool. You know? So, but amongst all these, uh, the, the paying gigs and everything you have managed to, uh, to put out some mm. really, uh, what I consider to be exceptional artistic, uh, records like your solo records. I, I, I forgot all about those. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> well, Carl. <laughs> I didn't. They're fantastic. Oh, thanks, so, man. Um, so how, uh, how, <clears throat> what's the experience been like for you trying to work that in while you're doing all the, uh, the, the kind of money gig kind of thing. Yeah, it was, um, you know, they were all done pretty much on the cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough just to have really good friends, really talented friends mm-hmm. that were willing to, to basically donate their efforts mm-hmm. and, and really seemingly at least happy to do so. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, boy, looking back on that stuff, I really obviously put a lot of time, a lot of effort in, into that stuff. And, what what would happen would be the you know the writing process mm-hmm. the arranging the recording process all of all of that stuff you know finally get the product back and then it's like wow what do i do with this because mm-hmm. i was never really a touring guy uh, as far as doing my stuff at mm-hmm. least you know um so I, I you know subsequently i end up with all these boxes of, of <laughs> cds down in the basement i've got one right over there it's <laughs> in my cd same thing it's like they mock you every time you walk into the room right. um but uh, you know, every every CD I did, I would I would swear it would be the last one. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were several CDs I did solo CDs that I was hired to do, mm-hmm. um, doing like you know classical guitar arrangements of blah 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 or you know Christmas stuff or mm-hmm. different things that were kind of cool. And those were fun, just because I was getting paid good money to do them. Right. Um, doing my stuff, um, I never listened to to that music anymore. Maybe 
maybe once every five years, mm -hmm. I'll listen to a CD I've done. Right. And I can sort of enjoy it because I totally forgot <laughs> about what could have been, you know, as far as like some of the, right, you know, yeah. the, the, the notes that I meant to play and didn't play. <laughs> well, it's I mean? almost like listening to someone else at that point if you've yeah. kind of forgotten the experience a little bit. Totally, yeah. totally. Especially if it happens. Um, I remember I was, I was, I don't know, I was over in Austria or someplace like that touring and they had this guy who was, uh, you know, sort of my, uh, I don't know what the, the, the term is, charge de fair or whatever. He was he was like my chauffeur, whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was really into, you know, he was into my music. And remember he was listening to, uh, he had Dubious Tones, mm -hmm. which was, I think it was my second mm -hmm. uh, album that um, was playing in the car. And it took me so much by surprise. I was actually digging it. It's like, <laughs> wow, this, this is kind of cool. Whereas if I had actually made the effort to say, wow, I'm going to listen to this now, there would have been so much baggage that went along right. with it. It would have been a horrible experience. <laughs> right. But... Um, but I think that's that might, and that was a long time ago. Um, that might be the last time that I've listened to any of my stuff. Um, but I probably will at some point. I'll, I'll pull <laughs> yeah. something out and listen to it. Maybe. You should. It's very good. <laughs> oh, thanks, Carl. <laughs> I enjoy it a lot. Yeah. Well, your recommendation yeah. means a lot to me, so maybe I'll check some of this yeah. uh, Cunningham guy it, out. It and... comes with my highest <laughs> recommendation. <laughs> So yeah, tell me a little bit about uh, about what what got you into the slide playing uh, and and maybe inspired you and and uh, and where that's taken you. Yeah, th there was a point back when I lived in Rochester where I was really um, it was one of two points in my guitar life where I was really about to quit. Um, yeah, I'd been doing it for a while. Was really disillusioned. Um, just with music, with, with playing music, mm -hmm. with, with being a performer and everything. And I was really, you know, I was, I was gonna go back, uh, I was planning on going back and getting a teaching degree and I was probably gonna teach math or something mm -hmm. like that. That was my, my plan. And my brother had won some tickets to see the Almond Brothers at Darien Lake outside mm -hmm. of Buffalo, New York. And I was like, yeah, you know, cool, I'll go. And it was the tour where Dickie, I think he was in jail or something, <laughs> and, um, right. and Jack Pearson mm -hmm. was filling in for him. Yeah. And, um, and uh, that, that gig really kind of changed my life and in a couple ways. One was that I, it was so inspiring seeing that many people because it was packed mm -hmm. and people were just digging on every note. And you know the way the brothers just kind of like, they, they jammed even more than usual because they mm -hmm. couldn't do any of the Dickie songs. Right. So they really stretched out and right. these songs kept building and building and people were losing their minds. And just when you think they're going to go back to a chorus, <laughs> they'd step it up another notch. <laughs> right. And it was so, it was really super inspiring to mm -hmm. me seeing people react that way. And it kind of, kind of uh, rejuvenated me musically yeah. to see that, wow, you know, people do actually care nice. about music, you know. Um, the other takeaway from that was the slide playing. Mm -hmm. you know, it was Warren and Jack, both right. really good slide players. And I had a, you know, had a slide at home that I never really investigated. And from that day on, I was really, you know, I, was, I, I really dove headfirst into playing slide. Um, and uh, really, you know, you and I were talking earlier about feats of strength, about, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not so, like as guitar players, maybe not playing too musically, but going for like the flashy <laughs> stuff. And right. of course, I jumped into playing slide, trying to play like Donna Lee on slide, <laughs> and just doing all this crazy, just ridiculous uh -huh. stuff, and not really <clears throat> getting into how to get a good tone or anything. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to do all this crazy stuff. Um, but I eventually kind of, you know, backtreaded a little bit and, and got into just like, you know, just being able to play. working on, on touch yeah, nice and trying to you know trying to be somewhat melodic and expressive too yeah yeah th that's expressive. that that was the thing I think that really resonated with me um, was the, the the expressiveness mm -hmm. which um, eventually got stepped up a, a huge notch when I got into playing lap steel mm -hmm. which um, not that it's necessarily any more or less expressive than playing guitar or playing mm -hmm. slide guitar but to me it was just the the lack of frets 
and uh, um, you know, sort of like with the slide, you know, you're playing with a movable fret, and mm -hmm. it's a lot more vocal. Right. You know, um, you know, I, you know, Dwayne Allman was was huge for me. Dave Tronzo, which is a guy that not many people know about, mm -hmm. a fellow Rochesterian who mm -hmm. moved to New York City and became one of these knitting factory guys, kind of mm -hmm. avant-garde. Mm -hmm. Just you know, you get a chance to check out Dave Tronzo. Man, the guy's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, Sonny Landreth. Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, Bonnie Raitt, mm -hmm. and eventually, you know, Derek Trucks. Of course. <laughs> almost to the point of like, you know, Derek, I had to, I, I listened to him so much, I had to stop listening to <laughs> right. him. I, I, the only New Year's yeah. resolution I've ever made in my life was <laughs> <laughs> several years ago, I said, I need to stop listening to this guy because right. it was just, you know, I'd be playing these gigs, these lap steel gigs, you know, playing open E, and people would come up and say, dude, you're killing on that Derek Truck stuff. And it was like, <laughs> right. it was a dagger. You right, know what I mean? Right. It was like, because I was just copping so much of his stuff mm -hmm. and I wanted right. to be him. You know what I mean? Um, and it's funny because I ended up doing a few months after I, I went cold turkey on Derek, I ended up doing several gigs with Jan Rico Scott and mm -hmm. Todd Smalley, mm -hmm. which of course were the rhythm right. section in the Derek Trucks band mm -hmm. for, for many years. Right. And, um, and it was it was pretty funny because I remember telling talking to Jan Rico um, during one of our gigs someplace during a break and, and telling him that story and he was really he took it really serious he was like yeah man that was smart because with him it was almost like we could have been talking about substance abuse or something like that <laughs> and, and in a way not to I mean of course it's nowhere near as, as detrimental to your health as is is doing right. that kind of stuff but musically though yeah going down that path mm -hmm. can be really damaging absolutely you know so I I, I got I finally got to a point where I felt like I could. I could take the Derekisms and make them work maybe in my context mm -hmm. and, and be at peace with knowing that, yeah, that he was a, an influence on me and still is, and that it's okay to every now and then to do maybe a, a, an overt Derekism <laughs> and it's okay. <laughs> I did this Allman Brothers tribute show in Tifton, Georgia a few weeks ago where, um, you know, I was the main slide guy. Mm -hmm. And it was fun being able to actually, okay, I can actually let my Dwayne and Derek stuff just like wear it out on my sleeve <laughs> yeah. and not have to be self-conscious about sounding too much like those guys. Right. You know, so yeah, I, I reached a point in my playing where, you know, I used to, uh, you know, I, I went through the, the, the period, like we was talking about earlier, like the Steve Vai, you know, the, the, the kind of shredding, for me, it was always a shredding wannabe period where, you know, I never quite had the right hand chops and I used to fight it constantly. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was always into like Demiola mm -hmm. and Steve Morse guys right. with with monstrous right hands, guys like you, you know, that just, you know, could just, just great, great right hand technique. And that was one thing I was always, and I still am really self-conscious about with my playing, is that I don't have this, this great right hand. I don't even have a really good right hand as far as picking goes, <laughs> you know. Um, and I used to fight it. Um, I remember... Uh, going to work at, at AIM, mm -hmm. teaching there, and, and of course that's where we met. Right. And, and you know, you had this rep, you know, as being, you know, a rightfully deserved rep of, of being just this monstrous kind of, you know, technically oriented player. And I was always real self-conscious about like, you know, if I was playing and you'd walk in the room, I'd like start fumbling with my right hand because <laughs> I just didn't have any kind of <laughs> chops whatsoever. But, uh, um, but eventually, that that lack of technique. Uh, I, I read someplace a long time ago that a, a style is defined by how you deal with your limitations. Mm -hmm. And my way yeah. my, my way of dealing with that was to get into hybrid picking because mm -hmm. it was really the only way I could navigate certain types of lines. Right. And and I, I'm kind of glad that happened in a way because it did sort of lead me down a path I certainly would have would not have gotten into mm -hmm. had I not you know uh, just gotten sick of my own <laughs> ineptitude <laughs> <laughs> with a pick. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I eventually, it used to be, I, I felt like everything I played had to have some, you know, again, feet of strength in it, mm -hmm. some, some technical mm -hmm. <laughs> marvel, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Right. Every guitar solo had to have at least one moment. Right, right. And I, I've really kind of changed a lot in that, and I've gotten a lot more into just expressiveness. And I think a lot of it came from the slide and the lap mm -hmm. steel, how that's impacted my guitar playing. Right. I've gotten a lot more into just touch, just being able to really, um, I, in my mind, I think of it as the sweetness. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to play and just like.
you know, just really getting into like trying to tell more of a story and kind of singing nice. and not feeling obligated to, to like to throw in like stuff that might be faster than I can handle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and trying, you know, it, it really, I, I wouldn't call it a 180, but it's really been over the past several years. It's really impacted how I teach a mm. lot too. Because, you know, I've, I've, I've been teaching pretty much nonstop for, you know, over 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really changed that and really focusing on timing and pocket mm -hmm. has really folk. It, it's really changed my playing and changed how I teach because I kind of realized that was something that was missing for me. Mm -hmm. And I hear missing maybe in some other players mm -hmm. is, is not having that, you know, there's that deep pocket. Right. Um, you know, when I, it, it took me a long time to realize that, like when I'd listen to great jazz players mm -hmm. or, um, you know, any really any any genre of musician, mm -hmm. you know, bluegrass players, whatever, they all the, the one quality they all have is just great, great time. Absolutely. And and I, I never realized that because I was always looking for the more overt qualities. Yeah. And um and and you know, for a while I was doing a lot of jazz gigs here in Atlanta. And I'm I'm kind of like a poser at best at jazz. <laughs> You know, uh, a lot of like, you know, rock guys will think I'm a jazz guy, but the jazz guys are like, no, dude, you're, yeah. <laughs> right. go back and play your Van Halen or whatever, you know. Right. But um, uh, but I, w I was playing with all these great, great, great players and it really started to dawn on me. It's like, these guys, their timing is just so sick. Mm -hmm. Forget about the way they navigate the chord changes mm -hmm. and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the dexterity and speed and all that right. stuff, which... You know, back then I was fixated on. You know, sure. it was like just their time was just we sick. We all were fixated on dexterity and speed at one point. Yeah, sure. yeah, man. So I got to uh, I got into playing lap steel from uh, Guitar Player magazine back in the late '90s. Had an issue with Junior Brown, mm -hmm. uh, the great Austin-based uh, guitar player, yeah. steel player, singer. He was on the cover, and I'd never really lap steel was always kind of off my radar. Didn't really know anything about him. And there was a they had a little article in there about how to convert your guitar into a lap steel. And and actually, it's funny the guitar that I actually started playing back when I was a kid, uh, you know, kind of a junky little acoustic guitar with a warp neck. Um, I took a uh, a pencil and cut it off, and I took a steak knife and cut grooves for the strings and put it right next to the nut mm -hmm. to, to, to raise the raise string it up, so it yeah. could support the weight of the bar. And um, really kind of dope. I mean, once I went lap steel, I never looked back. <laughs> it just, it's something about it resonated with me. Mm -hmm. I think it was the primitiveness of it. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I didn't have the option, like as a slide player, I could still finger. Right. You know, I could You're still just committed the notes. with this. You're committed. <laughs> you, you have a, a bar, and it's like, good luck, buddy. You know? <laughs> um, and, and I just really dug the, just that primitive quality, you know? And um, it's funny that that guitar that I used, that, that guitar has is, is, is been all over the place as far as like on, you know, uh, you know soundtracks and, 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 you know, just... TV ads and records and stuff like that. Just it was still with a pencil, right. you know, underneath it because <laughs> nice. it just had this really cool tone to yeah. it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I got into playing the lap steel, and what happened for me was, uh, you know, like anything else, I almost like my guitar chops suffered mightily because mm -hmm. all I wanted to do was play lap steel. And I'm sure different band leaders I was playing for at the time, they're like, "Oh crap, Cunningham brought his steel again." <laughs> Damn, you know. <laughs> You know, because I was always showing up <laughs> with the lap right. steel, and uh, you know, uh, but but thank God for those people because that's mm -hmm. how I got you know pretty good at it was from right. being allowed to just sound horrible on the bandstand and just you know, kind of you know in front of people having yeah. to make it work. You know, um, what I found professionally had happened for me was I got to a point where I was getting pretty good, and I would get hired specifically to play lap steel. Like I'd you know. Uh, you know, producers would hire me to come in and play on records. Mm -hmm. uh, started off with like you know a couple country records where they had everything else in the can. They say, mm -hmm. "Yeah, we decided we wanted some steel guitar." So, yeah. um, you know, they'd have two songs for me. So I'd go in and you know the first day, you know, maybe cut some stuff, and uh, the next day I'd, I'd bring a telly or something. Mm -hmm. I just happen to have a guitar with me, and I'd go in and I'd, 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 I'd end up you know going and replacing the, the guitar parts too. Oh yeah. yeah. So I was you know kind of sneaky about yeah, that, yeah. but. Playing lap steel has definitely got me into some situations professionally that if I was just another guitar player, 
I mean, no offense. No. <laughs> None taken. <laughs> I don't mean, like, None taken. But, but if I didn't play this as well, I probably would not have been considered for some of the stuff that I eventually got into by way of lap steel, which a lot of that stuff eventually turned into more guitar positions. Mm -hmm. But it was lap steel that got me in the door. So right. um, there's, a, there's a lesson there. <laughs> um, the lap steel, the expressiveness of it, um, you know, at first, I was really, I was really into like that, and I still am into like the Western swing kind mm -hmm. of stuff. I just love the, you know. stuff man i just that's love awesome. i love that stuff that's incredible it's so musical and and cool and it's and i'm cool. that, that six chord sound is yeah just beautiful. totally totally so that's the tuning that's the tuning it's tuned yeah. to e6 and i reached a point where i was really self-conscious about things sounding maybe too old school country yeah. or like <laughs> hawaiian sounding <laughs> yeah. you know spongebob square pants yeah, whatever right. <laughs> so i went to open e and that's when i went through my little derrick addiction yeah um but eventually i came to terms with it i said you know dude it's okay to have some of that stuff come out in your playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's a welcome uh, sound that, that that people have gotten so far away from most of the time now that it's kind of great to hear it again. It know? is really it's, inviting. It's nostalgic a little bit and warm. There's, there's, yeah. a, there's definitely a warmth to it. I think it was, I think Bill Hart mentioned that to me once. He said, yeah, something about that six chord tuning. It's just really inviting. It really yeah. kind of, like you said, just really welcoming. It just makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> we need more of that. <laughs> we sure do. Yeah. And, and of course, where there's a mi where there's a, a six chord, there's a minor seven. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, if I'm playing, a, if I want to play in C minor, then I've got... So, you know, there's that, that minor sound too, which doesn't sound at all Hawaiian, you right. know? So that was kind of, you know, that's kind of cool. So your, your, uh, your, your hybrid picking thing then transitions into this. So, yeah. so now you've got something ready-made yep, going yep. from electric to this that'll actually, a technique that crosses over. Yeah, it does. And I should be, you know, the, the purists, I mean, most of the, the right. real dudes, they use a thumb pick and the metal sure. finger picks. And, you know, I'm sacrificing my index finger holding the pick, but I like having the pick. So if I really want to... I can really kind of look at um, Yeah. You know, the other, the Sacred Steel stuff was mm -hmm. huge for me. Right, um, right. Robert Randolph. Robert Randolph, yeah. but uh, the, the Campbell brothers mm -hmm. were really it for me. Cam uh, Aubrey Gent, mm -hmm. whose son, AJ Gent, lives here in Atlanta, okay. who's just a, a monster steel player. Yeah, I think monster. I've seen some some uh, some footage of him. Yeah. yeah, boy, that stuff, that stuff really made an impact on me. That nice. and you know, kind of that and Derek are both mm -hmm. kind of coming from that same place. You right. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally a, a similar sonic for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Derek was you know Derek's really into that stuff too. Um, and I think a lot of those guys are into Derek. You know. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, and that just that vocal kind of. gospel vocal style yeah. yeah yeah it's really you know we also got like the the Dwayne stuff the um now I've got my little hip shot thing here so I can change like a lot of times I'll just go to like uh, almost like more of a power chord kind of thing so if I want to play you know And 
Anyways, cool. so yeah, I was wondering about the about the bridge here. You had some, uh, you have some a lot of tuning options, I guess. And I totally underutilize it, but like you know, you got this cool, uh, um, get get a cool minor six kind of sound here. So, uh, yeah, I need I need to bolster my tuning uh, vocabulary. That's that's cool. Even even just a couple of options makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, very cool. All right, Steve. Well, it was great to have you and uh, to uh, to talk about your style and uh, and uh, all the different things that came into play to get you from uh, from Rochester to here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. So again, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Awesome. Thanks for the opportunity, man. Okay, I hope you enjoyed hanging out with Steve as much as I did. And if you want to learn more about Steve and his music, uh, look for him on iTunes and CD Baby, among other outlets. And if you like this video, click like and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like it in the future. And I hope you will, and I hope to see you soon. So come on back. Mm -hmm.